Krista. Um, and welcome everyone. My name is Lori Bambaco. I am an oncology dietitian. I'm presenting to you live from Cancer Wellness Center. I'm in the Susan Barr demo kitchen that we are very fortunate to have here at the center at my disposal. Uh, so be on the lookout for some of our events coming up. They'll be on the calendar on our website. We do have something planned in the middle of June, which will be in person in this kitchen. Very exciting. Uh, we're calling it Nourish Bowls and it's going to be interactive. So you get to kind of make your own Nourish Bowl. Uh, so please just check out the website for a description of that, how to register for the program. It's all right on our website, cancerwellness.org. So it is so lovely to see everyone on this wonderful Monday afternoon. Thank you for joining me. And if you're watching the recording, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to hopefully learn a little something from me today, all about the Mediterranean diet. Um, and what I'd like to do is share my screen and a PowerPoint that I've prepared for you. If you have registered for the program, you will have access to these slides. They'll be sent out to you directly. So I'm going to get started because I have lots to share. And we're going to have a lot of fun today and hopefully have an interactive time together. So without further ado, I will share my screen. And Lisa will just let me know if I have any uh, technical difficulties along the way. <laughs> but here is uh, the presentation all about the Mediterranean diet. And I'd like to help introduce you to some of the concepts of the Mediterranean diet. So what I'd like to first start with is a review. What is this Mediterranean diet all about? And when you see the initials MD, that's really what I'm referring to a Mediterranean diet from here on out, because I wanted to save space on my slides. So we're just going to go with MD. All right. Now, besides this review, I want to dive deeper into the health benefits that are associated with the Mediterranean diet, but more specifically, the cancer protective benefits that have been shown through research. And then we're gonna take some time to highlight some of the special food and ingredients of interest within this Mediterranean diet. And then we'll have time uh, along the way, but then especially at the end for additional questions or comments that you may have. As I mentioned along the way, we'll have this opportunity to be interactive. I wanna test your knowledge of the Mediterranean diet to see if you um, acquire some new information as a consequence of attending this <laughs> webinar. Okay, so let's uh, start first with the Mediterranean diet and a review of the Mediterranean diet. I have a question for you. How many countries are included in the Mediterranean? And I have a point to make about this. So if you wanna keep the, your guesses to yourself, I understand. Bonus points for anyone who writes them down and sends them to me. <laughs> so how many countries? This may be a surprise to you. Um, we have an answer about 10. I think that's a great guess. You might be surprised, right? Because the Mediterranean diet, I think um, many people that I know associate it with, especially Greece and Italy. But guess what? This is a map here. These are all of the countries that surround the Mediterranean Sea. So this is why we consider this region or this area to be the Mediterranean. And so the foods that are consumed in these countries, if you count them right now, you might you might have the correct answer. <laughs> it's 21. So there's 21 countries that border the Mediterranean Sea and all of the foods that they are consuming are considered to be a part of the Mediterranean diet. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But the foods and flavors are as diverse as the countries are within the Mediterranean. I think that's an important point to make, right? Because there's more than one way to explore this way of eating for yourself. Now, what you might notice is that there are three continents that are included in the Mediterranean, Europe, Asia, and Africa. So imagine, think about all the different types of flavors that come to mind when you think of those different countries and how really the flavors that we're gonna dive into are specific to that region, to that area. However, despite this diversity, there are some common themes about the way that they seem to eat their meals and also the, the foods that they enjoy, right? The, we're going to call that the style of eating. So what they tend to gravitate towards most of the time in their diet. So why, what is so appealing? 
maybe you're attending today because you're like, I've heard about this Mediterranean diet. Tell me more. What's so appealing about the Mediterranean diet? Well, experts argue that it is family friendly. So depending on your family, you might agree that you can gather around the table and really enjoy all the different types of foods and flavors of this diet. It's arguably budget friendly. Um, the Mediterranean diet is an example of a plant-based diet. So for example, if you're consuming lentils or beans more often than you are something like sirloin, then arguably you're going to be saving some money. It's also regarded as planet-friendly. And this is an image from Barilla Pasta, our makers of pasta here. Um, and the point here is that it is you see on the left, that's kind of like the food pyramid, which we can do so much better than that. Lots to talk about this food pyramid. Uh, but what, what the bottom of the pyramid is meant to demonstrate what we emphasize in a Mediterranean diet. So hopefully you see it's a lot of plant food. So a lot of whole grains and beans and lentils, and then those vegetables and fruit, those at the same time on the inverted pyramid are have a low environmental impact. So this is really ap appealing for those of us who are eating for planetary health. I'm just checking the, the chat. Okay, so, so, so another reason why the Mediterranean diet might be appealing, right? And this was an interesting statistic that I just had to include. So it takes 10 gallons of water to produce only one calorie of beef, while it takes one gallon of water to produce one calorie, of whole grains. Very interesting, right? And it takes maybe two gallons for vegetables and three for fruit. So we can see how, if those are the foods we're eating the most of, they're going to impact our environment in a beneficial way. Also, the appeal is that it technically, this Mediterranean diet is vegetarian and it could be modified to be vegan. Also, the recipes or the ingredients and foods and flavors can be modified to be halal and kosher friendly as well. So you can see there's an appeal for many different people for many different reasons, right? Depending on yours, you might agree that it might be worthy of some consideration. Another question for you. This is a true or false. The Mediterranean diet is a specific meal plan. I think most of you will get this one right. <laughs> so I'm just checking my, my audience and they're doing an amazing job in the chat. This, the answer to this is that, yes, it's false. The Mediterranean diet is not a specific meal plan. It's not a diet per se. In fact, it's just, a, we use that word diet to describe that it's a way of eating or a style of eating. It definitely is not a fad diet, even though it might seem to be like one right now. There are staples of the Mediterranean diet that are mostly plant foods. So that includes vegetables, fruit, whole grains, beans, peas, lentils, nuts, and seeds. The Mediterranean diet includes a lot of quality fats. In fact, the majority of the fats that they eat come from extra virgin olive oil. They also enjoy fats from olives, avocado, nuts, and seeds. And their primary source of protein comes from um, fish, so seafood and shellfish, so sea seafood, and then beans, peas, lentils, and nuts. So they're enjoying a lot of protein from plant sources as well. So we see this abundant of whole plant foods. There are small amounts of low-fat dairy included in the Mediterranean diet, but it also is low in other foods. So low in red meat consumption, as well as processed meat and especially saturated fats. There's a limit on processed foods. So not a lot of highly processed foods are consumed in the Mediterranean and not a lot of refined sugary foods also in the Mediterranean. You may be wondering, what about wine? So wine, and it's typically red wine, it is consumed um, with most of the meals and they tend actually typically to eat two meals a day. They may skip breakfast in the Mediterranean. And this red wine isn't sort of like an invitation to now liberally enjoy wine. And we could talk about that more if you'd like. Uh, but a small amount of red wine is, is really like sipped over time during their meals in the Mediterranean. They're really enjoying just a small amount. Okay. So keep that in mind and also keep in the mind, keep in mind the context with which they're sipping their red wine. Another quiz question, how much fiber per day do Americans eat on average? 
So those of you who know me know I'm a big stickler for fiber. I'm a big advocate proponent for fiber uh, because we need to eat more of it. And fiber has a lot of health benefits, uh, especially associated with cancer protection. So here's a snapshot of what the Mediterraneans eat in a day. And it's a lot of whole plant foods. So this is like the best of everything we could possibly imagine as it relates to nutrition. Lots of vegetables. They probably have six or more a day because they're having a couple at each meal. They're having a, one or two servings of fruit at each meal. They're having one or two servings of whole grains at each meal. They're using olive oil in their food preparation or to flavor their meal. They're having eggs a couple times a week. They have nuts once or twice a day, dairy once or twice a day. They're having legumes at least two per week. They may have way more than that. Um, and their fish consumption is at least two per week as well. And I, I spoke to this. This is what they're enjoying, but here's what they're not enjoying. They're not having a lot of red meat or sweets. So they're having less than two servings per week or less than four per month. And that's that's even a kind of an exaggeration. I think it's even less than this, especially historically. Um, and sweets are maybe two to four sweets per week, if that. Now, back to that question about fiber, uh, the Mediterranean diet, because of all the plant foods that are on it, is high in fiber. So they're consuming on average about 31 to 33 grams of fiber per day. And that's more than what the experts recommend. The experts are advising anywhere from 25 up to maybe 38 grams, depending on your body size and your gender. Now, Americans are failing in this category. <laughs> we have much work to do. We are consuming on average about 10 grams of fiber per day. So we're at a third of what the Mediterraneans are enjoying. So how to design a Mediterranean plate. This is sort of like your cheat sheet, okay? And this looks a lot similar to a cancer protective plate as well. So it's a nice combination of the two. So hopefully what you observe about this um, template is that it is loaded up with whole plant foods. So you see there's a ton of vegetables right off the start, right? Half of the plate is occupied by these vegetables. A quarter of the whole plate is occupied by another um, plant food and that is whole grains or your beans and legumes. And then we also see some fruit. So really we're eating mostly plant foods here, right? And then the remaining one quarter of the plate is for our protein source. And typically again, in the Mediterranean, it's either fish or shellfish. Now, what you'll notice is that there are some nuts that are used on the side, maybe to garnish um, or to use for flavor. We're going to talk about that. Um, they're using olive oil as their principal cooking oil, and they're enjoying water. Um, and they're also flavoring their meals with a lot of herbs and spices. I think that's the most fun about a Mediterranean diet. And then as you can see also on the bottom left of that image, they're not having a lot of highly processed foods, right? I would describe this plate as like a homemade meal, right? And that's a really important concept of the Mediterranean diet as well. So how would that look in terms of a meal? <laughs> so, so same plate, but let's say it's the salmon with some, a salad with lots of veggies added to that salad. You know, maybe it's tomatoes and zucchini and peppers. Maybe there's some Kalamata olives some, for some nice bite, but flavor, but quality flavor, right? Because of the healthy fats that are in it. And then dessert is something like fruit, like orange and fig and strawberries mixed together. Really a great, delicious way to add a lot of nutrition to your diet. So let's dig a little deeper into the health benefits of the Mediterranean diet. Hopefully that's why you're here. So we have overall known that the Mediterranean diet is, it's very popular right now because the research has supported its health benefits over the year. But the important point to make is that it's the overall diet and it's the quality of the overall diet, right? It's no single food or no single ingredient or nutrient within the diet that matters. It's this overall effect. And that's where we're always going to reap the, the maximum amount of nutrition if we consider everything that we're eating, right? So keep that in mind. Now, this the interest with the Mediterranean diet, it started a while ago. It was in the 50s and 60s, and it was thanks to doc, Dr. Ansel Keys, and he began this research study over in um, Greece and Italy, but there were a couple other countries as well, um, obviously, because it was called the Seven Countries Study, and he was interested to look at um, what people were eating and its associated 
effects on cardiovascular disease. That was his particular interest. So they actually have a website all about this information. So if you're curious to learn more, uh, please uh, take a look at that website for yourself. Um, they obviously found tremendous cardiovascular benefits from this way of eating and probably because of the type of fats that are being consumed. It's not a low fat diet. It's actually a high fat diet. And it's a lot of these quality, healthy fats. Uh, they did look at 13,000 men that were living in those areas. So keep that in mind as it, as it, as we think about, does this generalize to the uh, population? Now, research since that time, and there's been a lot of it, like almost too much for me to even highlight for you today. There's been a lot of interest in the Mediterranean diet. We know for right now, it seems pretty convincing that consuming this way of this style of eating, that it may reduce the risk for heart disease and stroke, and especially by lowering blood pressure. It may lower the risk for cognitive decline and dementia. It may lower type two diabetes, specifically by lowering blood sugar levels. It may reduce the symptoms and progression of inflammatory autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis. Really interesting, right? So again, we see why this might be so appealing. Like what is the Mediterranean diet not good for? It seems like it's the cure all, right? And it's also associated with weight loss and reduced waist circumference. So that may be of interest for some of you. And it certainly is of interest for those um, of us in the oncology world who have seen that um, an, an extra amount of abdominal obesity seems to be linked with cancer risk. So here's one potential application for this way of eating that may be beneficial for you. And it's no wonder that the, you may be aware of this, the U.S. News and World Health Report, like consistently year after year, ranks this as their number one overall best diet. And I think it's partly because of these health benefits, but also to what I highlighted earlier, there's, it seems to be an appeal for so many different people for lots of different reasons. So here is um, a nice image. It's, it's complicated, but it's, it's, it's that way for a reason. I want to demonstrate a point here. So here are some of the principal foods that are in a Mediterranean diet, right? We see them listed there on the left. Now, all of these foods contain all of these different nutrients and compounds, even non-nutrients like phytochemicals. They don't give us any nutrition, but they exert health effects. And it's a really kind of complex relationship we see here, right? So fruit has fiber, but fruit also has phytochemicals. It also has phytosterols. Look at whole grains. Like what does whole grains, what do whole grains not have? It's amazing. So then we see all of these compounds and nutrients that are in these Mediterranean foods. Here's how they work. They may work like an antioxidant. They have been shown, especially fiber to lower insulin resistance. So that improves our blood sugar. It definitely lowers cholesterol either in the, by blocking absorption in, in the gut or inhibiting how much cholesterol we make. Phytosteroids have been shown to control the absorption or lower the absorption of cholesterol in our gut. And when we're eating a lot of polyunsaturated fats, we're not eating a lot of those saturated fats. So it's a contrast and that's the point there. So we see like, there's a lot of things going on here. A lot of reasons why all of these foods with all of their compounds have been shown to be beneficial for us. But what more specifically about cancer? We've got a lot of good evidence there too. So there's epidemiological studies that suggest that the Mediterranean diet is a model for primary and secondary prevention of many chronic diseases, and that includes cancer types. So when we say epidemiological, what that means is basically ob observational studies of populations, right? So that's not really a clinical trial or, you know, a scientific study that's designed really what they do with epidemiological studies are they ask people, what do you eat? You know, how do you prepare that food? How do you eat your food? And then they then ask them, what are your health conditions? And they follow them over time to see, is there a relationship between the two? Incidence of cancer in the Mediterranean countries is lower than in both in all of the US, in the UK, as well as Scandinavian countries. 
Interesting. So is that that diet? It might be a part of the puzzle, right? And then the EPIC trial, if you haven't heard of the EPIC trial, it's um, a really large trial. They're taking like half a million people over in Europe. And what they are doing is following their lifestyle, but specifically nutrition um, and diet. And what they have found is that there was an associated lower overall cancer risk when those people were more, were eating a diet that were closer, looked like a Mediterranean diet. So really interesting, right? A lot of good data from Epic. All right, another, it's time for a quiz question, right? It's been a while. So true or false, whole grains have carbs and therefore they are not recommended for cancer protection. I trust most of you know the answer for this one. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna move on. So this, um, what I wanna do is just dive deeper into some of the foods that are in this Mediterranean diet that seem to exert cancer protection specifically. So we'll start with fruits and vegetables. Well, that's a no-brainer, right? So look at all of the compounds that are in fruits and vegetables. And you got to trust me on this one. These exert lots of different cancer protect protective properties on lots of different levels. So anytime you're saturating your body with them, you are helping yourself, right? Really maximizing the cancer protective properties of food when you're eating fruits and vegetables and a variety of them. So the research shows that when we're eating a diet that's high in fruits and vegetables, there's a reduced risk for digestive cancers, breast cancer, gynecological cancers, as well as bladder cancer. Next, we'll move on to whole grains. Who knew? Whole grains offer cancer protection. <laughs> and that's because of some of the compounds and vitamins, as well as fiber that you see exist in a variety of whole grains, right? And they all are great. So think of your intact whole grains from oats to wild rice, to barley, to bulgur. They're all fantastic choices. And especially some are found in the Mediterranean diet that may be of interest to you like farro or millet, really interesting. And the research has shown reduced risk for breast, ovarian, stomach, as well as kidney cancer. Americans do not eat enough whole grains or fruit or vegetables either. Next quiz question, what about dairy? Would dairy be recommended for cancer protection? We're gonna move on. Okay, so extra virgin olive oil. Of course I have to mention extra virgin olive oil, like 40% of the calories that are consumed on the Mediterranean diet come from extra virgin olive oil. Fascinating, right? They eat a lot of it, they enjoy it. So here's what we find inside extra virgin olive oil. And not all olive oil is the same. So extra virgin, fresh, really fresh squeezed juice out of those olives, they're gonna retain most of these compounds that exert cancer protection. And what we see in the research is that those individuals that are consuming the, um, the greater amount of extra virgin olive oil compared to lesser amount have reduced risk for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, upper aerodigestive cancers, as well as colorectal cancer. Now we're gonna answer that quiz question. So what about dairy? Guess what? Dairy is cancer protective. So there are some um, important um, vitamins, but also um, minerals and also other compounds. I like to mention dairy, especially fermented dairy, because it gives us this lactic, lactic acid producing bacteria or probiotics as you would have it. So really impacting the gut in ways that are beneficial, especially to support our immune function, which has implications for the cancer, for cancer protection. Now, lactoferrin, you see that word there on the slide. Um, really what that is, is a, it's a protein, it's a molecule. So it has protein and a carbohydrate and iron attached to it. And it's found in cow's milk, but even uh, breast milk. So colostrum has a really high amount of lactoferrin. I learned this along the way. Um, and we have learned it was in the 1970s and 80s, they learned about this molecule and it, they found that it had antibacterial, antimicrobial, as well as um, immunomodulating abilities. So this again is important for cancer protection. Um, we also uh, further research into lactoferrin specifically in the oncology setting showed that it may um, inhibit the cell cycle. So telling cancer cells to die um, so not inhibit, but induce the cell cycle arrest. So telling cancer cells to die, it may induce apoptosis and it also may hinder migration and invasiveness of cancer cells. 
and it also has this immunomodulating effect. So really not a bad idea to include some fermented dairy, especially. In the research, fermented dairy has been shown to be protective for breast cancer, as well as especially colorectal cancer. So we'd no need to avoid it. Okay. And we can talk more about that if you feel you need to. Okay. So those were some of the food specifically the research has shown for cancer protection. Let's dive deeper into the foods and flavors of the Mediterranean diet. Now do keep in mind, I'm going to highlight like my top 10, but they're just my top 10. And they just seem to be interesting to me that I wanted to share with you, but you would be selling yourself short if you only focus on these 10 foods, right? The Mediterranean diet is such a complex um, really vast array of a lot of different foods that are consumed in such a diverse way, right? So even, in, and if you think of those 21 countries, how many different choices, how many different recipes um, you can enjoy, right? And don't sell yourself short by only focusing on these. Quiz question, extra virgin olive oil is not to be used in cooking. hear this one a lot. We're going to answer that question now. Okay. So olives and olive oil, what, what's, what's so great about olives and olive oil? Well, they have cancer fighters. So you see listed on the slide there. And again, just take my word for it. They exert cancer protection. The ways that we can use olives. I, I love this. Obviously we know we can use olive oil in cooking, but how can we use olives? So I love the idea of partnering it even with fruit. It, it's like such an interesting con, uh, contrast, especially with something like melon or strawberries. You can slice it into a salad with some orange and citru and avocado. I love adding it to something like tuna or like a chickpea salad and that you mix together with hummus. So olive oil itself, extra virgin olive oil has been shown from research studies to be the most stable oil when heated. Is that new to you? Is that new information? It might be. So that's all thanks to that last cancer fighter, olecanthal. Uh, that's a very powerful polyphenol. And it's really what gives the anti-inflammatory properties to olive oil and olives. And you might know this distinct kind of uh, pungent flavor. If you've had fresh, high quality olive oil, it kind of gets a, like a bite in the back of your throat. Um, and that's all thanks to this ole oleocanthal. Okay. So it's interesting that sometimes the color like phytochemicals, like a red orange or red apple in lycopene or tomato is lycopene, but sometimes the flavor like olecanthal is what exerts the cancer protection. Another quiz question. This fruit was described in Italy as mala orea, which is Latin for golden apple. One of my favorites. That's why I chose it. <laughs> so it's tomatoes. And there's lots of cancer fighters to be found in tomatoes, including uh, phenolic acids, uh, flavonoids, carotenoids, vitamin A, and glycoalkaloids. Um, vitamin e A is important for our immune function as well. So sometimes that's of interest for um, individuals. But what we have found about um, these cancer fighters are that they work like antioxidants as well. So what they do is they fix cells that get broken. Sometimes we're exposed to carcinogens in our environment. And so that can induce the carcinogenic process. We need to repair that, right? And so antioxidants are the way to do that. And tomatoes are high in those. Um, there also are anti-inflammatory properties to tomatoes. And I love uh, fresh tomatoes at a particular time of the year, right? The end of the summer, early fall. It's just the, the freshness at our local farm market. I think you agree. They taste absolutely divine and they don't require much work, right? So they're great as is and simple simple, simple ingredients uh, really can make a stellar dish for you. So something like tomatoes with some olive oil and cracked pepper and some fresh basil. I mean, that is like so refreshing and delicious and yet cancer protective at the same time. Now, what I thought I would do is share a recipe called Ensme, Esme, sorry. Um, and it's Turkish and it's actually a condiment. And it could be used really as sort of like something to dip in. So whether you want to dip a kebab in it or some whole grain pita, um, it really packs a lot of great flavor. Okay, we're going to move on to the next. This is bulgur, one of my favorites too. It's a whole grain. Um, and here are the cancer fighters inside bulgur. Bulgur wheat is considered like the original 
fast food <laughs> because it cooks so quickly. Some bulgers do not even require cooking. You can just soak them in equal amounts of water, which is really phenomenal, right? So um, bulgur is um, originates from Anatolia, which is modern day Turkey. Um, and in the Middle East as well as, as part of the Mediterranean. So bulgur has um, what you see on their carotenoids. So lutein and zeaxanthin, that's really great as sunscreen for our eyes. And also has tocopherols and tocotrienols. And those are compounds that are part of vitamin E. Did you know that? So vitamin E is an important antioxidant, important for our um, immune function, but again, antioxidants to come in and fix cells that are damaged. Did you know that there's more than one type of vitamin E? There's actually eight different kinds of vitamin E. So this is where food is superior to supplements because most often in a supplement, they're only going to give you one type of vitamin E, but in our foods, we can eat seven other types and really reap the benefits of these antioxidant little cancer fighters. So how to enjoy bulgur? Um, it's a blank slate, right? So they're they're small grains. So think of it almost like as you would use it in couscous or quinoa. You can probably make bulgur. A traditional recipe is tabbouleh, um, which is a delicious, refreshing summer salad, Lebanese um, with with um, tomatoes and onions and fresh herbs. Um, you could add it to your soups. I've even seen uncooked bulgur added to baked goods. So imagine what that's doing. It's infusing more cancer protection, infusing more fiber as well, and really giving it a different texture. So this is a Lebanese bulgur pilaf. And again, I think like, just think of your basic grains that are a blank slate, but this one is a different one, right? And that's where we can really tap into the Mediterranean diet. And you could flavor this kind of blank slate, whole grain, however you desire. Oops. Okay, next quiz question. <laughs> Persephone was tricked into eating this fruit after being kidnapped by Hades, the king of the underworld. This should be like a bonus question because this one's really tricky. <laughs> So the answer is pomegranate. I just love pomegranate. So there's lots of cancer fighters inside this really unique fruit, including anthocyanins, including tannins and flavonoids and cumestrol. Again, it seems to exert these um, properties that are cancer protective by working to be an antioxidant, but also to lower inflammation. It will inhibit cancer cell proliferation. So this is why we recommend eating these foods, not only to prevent cancer in the first place, but if you're diagnosed and seeking to reduce risk for progression or recurrence, we know that these foods with these compounds are going to protect you on some level. So there's lots of different ways to enjoy pomegranate, but I want to point out the arils, which are the bright red juicy seeds that we find inside the pomegranate. Sometimes you may find the pomegranate, the whole fruit in the grocery store, but you might not other times. And I want you to look in the uh, produce section. Usually it's chilled. Uh, some food manufacturers will take out those arils for us and put them in a little cup so we don't have to do the work. How convenient is that? And these arils are great. They're like They are little bursts of flavor and juice and little pop. Uh, so they add a nice little spark, like a little vibrant spark <laughs> to some of your favorite current meals. So something like oats, or if you are making a smoothie, I love to add over plain yogurt, some arrows with chopped up pistachios, or you can add them to a grain salad. You can add them to your green salad, chop in some fresh herbs, and you have this whole new flavor profile that maybe you haven't thought of before. Um, really simple way is with spinach, even baby spinach and some citrus, and then a light vinaigrette with some pomegranate arrows. You can even chop up some walnuts or pomegranate or sorry, pistachio is on top. I think that makes for a really delicious, new to you yet Mediterranean um, um, meal. Next, I, I love black eyed peas. <laughs> so black eyed peas and all beans essentially have cancer fighters that we're aware of. So a couple of vitamins A and C, great for our immune system, phenolic compounds, as well as flavonoids. And they, um, especially these phenolic compounds, I want to point out all beans, including black eyed peas contain them and they impact our gut. 
So the way that they work is that they help to lower insulin resistance. And this is a good thing because they will then help us manage our blood sugar levels. So this is why when we eat foods with like beans and lentils that have these phenolic compounds, we actually feel really satiated. And some people say they feel kind of energized because the blood sugars are controlled, right? They're having this nice sustained controlled energy level, which is really fantastic. Um, also the fiber that are in black eyed peas and any bean are impacting our gut because it's feeding, it's giving our good bacteria that reside in our gut fuel. And we know that when we do that, they're going to flourish and they're going to help secrete anti-inflammatory compounds throughout our whole body. And they're also going to help to support our immune function. So black eyed peas really think of any bean that you might currently enjoy and how you might use black eyed peas instead. Um, I like to mix it with other whole grains. So it's like this, like something like bulgur or again, quinoa, and then whatever vegetables you have on hand with some beans, including black eyed peas, and then toss it with a vinaigrette. It's a very satisfying, simple side dish, especially great for the summer. If you're going on a picnic, be great for Memorial day. Um, but Black eyed peas in, in this country are most often known um, in the recipe Hop and John. So if, you know, if you're familiar with that, that's consumed in the South. And um, when they consume it in the South on New Year's Day, it means that they're bringing a year of good luck to themselves. So it means prosperity, right? And I love that as an idea for you really to have any time of the year, not just one day. Now, black eyed peas, you may find dry, you may find in a can. I think find and use whatever you prefer. They're both great choices. If you're finding them in a can, I would encourage you to rinse them because probably there was some salt added to the beans, to the beans or peas. So you're going to rinse away most of the salt and sodium when you do that. Now, black eyed peas in this dish, this is uh, from Cyprus. It's called Luvi. And it's a really simple, and that's what I love about the Mediterranean. It's simple. It's black eyed peas with some chard and then some extra virgin olive oil and some um, lemon juice. You can add some other vegetables into the mix as well. Like you see some carrots there, but really simple, delightful way of eating. Another quiz question. What is the name of a dry nutty condiment that is typically made with Dried mint, walnuts, sesame seeds, coriander, cumin, salt, and pepper. Wow, that sounds like a flavor bomb. <laughs> That's a lot going on in there. So walnuts, I have to include walnuts on my list, right? There's lots of cancer fighters inside walnuts, including these urolithins. And they're of interest because we have, uh, the research has found in uh, vitro studies so that means in test tube lab studies and in animal studies, they find that these urolithins exert an, an effect on the aromatase enzyme. So what they do is they actually have been shown to inhibit the aromatase enzyme. So for any of you who are on maintenance medications for breast cancer, you may be on a, an aromatase inhibitor. So the walnuts contain these urolithins and the urolithins seem to work along the same pathway. They probably don't have the same strength of effect, but it's still there and we can't deny it. So it's worthy of consideration for you to think about using some walnuts. Um, there also are other properties to some of these compounds in walnuts, such as melatonin. That's best known for managing our circadian rhythms, right? And inducing sleep. But did you know that melatonin's actually have been shown to reduce the growth of breast cancer and prostate cancer cells. Really fascinating, right? And also I think if you're looking to help you manage your sleep, maybe you wanna include some walnuts actually to help you in that process. Um, alpha linolenic acid is an omega-3 acid and that is from a plant food. So if you're looking to enhance the anti-inflammatory properties, walnuts are also a great choice for you. But I just listed like, three things, three of those cancer fighters, and you can see how it exerts different effects on different levels. So this is why we want to recognize that just, just one food out of so many can help protect us in so many different ways. How do, 
how to try walnuts. There's so many ways. I I, I had to stop myself. I listed a handful, uh, but I love them. Just keep them in your fridge and just add them to whatever you're eating. It's They're really sort of mild in flavor, but they're going to give you crunch and texture. Um, you could definitely make your own dishes like use instead of pine nuts, walnuts for your pesto the next time you make it. Um, and you could see how you can get that diverse range of all of these different ingredients. So dukkha was the answer to that question. Have you ever heard of dukkha? I made it once um, and it's an Egyptian spice blend essentially. And the word translates uh, from the word uh, or the verb to pound, because literally that's what you're doing. You're taking this blend of different nuts and seeds and warm spices and you're basically like crushing them together. So you see a mortar mortar and pestle there, uh, but you can use a spice grinder or a coffee grinder. Um, and it really is a delicious way to add some different interesting flavor to your food. So if you roasted some vegetables or you have a cooked pasta or cooked green, you can even use this on top of your protein as a coating. Um, you might find dukkha homemade or, or you can make your own dukkha, but you might find it in the grocery store. Someone put in the chat. Thank you for that. So it saves you some time, right? Uh, but uh, yes, and I've seen dukkha and you can even go to a spice shop and probably find dukkha. Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's an involved recipe. All right. So if you want to try there first and then see if you enjoy it, then maybe you can expand and, and make your own. I love it. That's great flavor. Next, we're going to go to lentils, one of my absolute favorites in the kitchen. So if you're not a fan of beans, you might be a fan of lentils, maybe. Um, plenty of cancer fighters, just like beans, they're sort of like the cousin. They're in the same family there. Um, so we see fiber, anthocyanins, flavin alls, which if you're someone who's into that word detoxification, flavin alls are the way to go. And lentils can help us do that. They actually stimulate enzymes that help us that turn on detoxification systems in our body. Lignans are one of um, a very important type of compounds that offer antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. And proanthocyanidins, you may have heard of them. They, they tell cancer cells to die. So we like all of these compounds, right? All in one, all in one package, we get all of these things. So how to try lentils? You know, I love lentils that are pre-cooked and you may also find them in some of your favorite grocery stores. They're great to add to as is. You can just enjoy them cold. You can warm them up if they're pre-cooked and you can add them to your salad. You can actually pop lentils by sauteing them. I haven't tried that one yet. Um, they're great as a filling. So as a way to replace ground meat, you can use lentils in your stuffed pepper or stuffed zucchini, or again, in any other kind of ground meat recipe, like a burger or a meatloaf. I encourage you to try lentils as a swap out. So this is a Turkish salad and I do have, um, it's a lentil salad. Um, I do have recipes for you to enjoy as well. All right, but lentils, I think if they're dried lentils that you're using, lots of different varieties of them as well. They also like whole grains are a blank slate. So you find your plate flavor profile and you can add your own spin on whatever lentil or whatever whole grain you'd like right? And then infuse that with some fresh cut vegetables or some cooked vegetables sauteed left over from last night, if you're roasted, and then you've really managed to eat in a way that's similar to Mediterranean that you will reap the benefits from yogurt, right? We talked a little bit about this earlier. So there are cancer fighters in yogurt, including probiotics and B vitamins, specifically folate, which folate is a, a B vitamin that helps to repair DNA um, when it becomes damaged. Probiotics exert their impact in the gut in beneficial ways. So most of our immune function is sitting right inside our gut and it's really complicated, but we can support our health and our immune function in that way by consuming foods with probiotics. Now, what I want to encourage you to do is go Mediterranean when you think of yogurt. So we don't necessarily want to have sweet dessert type yogurt that most Americans enjoy, but rather some plain yogurt and to use it in a style that is similar to the Mediterranean. So they may um, use sauces most often by combining some lemon juice, olive oil, some herbs, maybe some different spices, and they use that as a sauce. Um, I've even seen yogurt with Dijon mustard and tarragon, which is a lovely dressing. 
Um, and you can use that even to top your fish. I had to include tzatziki, say that with me three times, tzatziki, um, really one of the great, I think, like quintessential applications of yogurt in a Mediterranean way. And it's a very refreshing, super, super refreshing um, uh, dip that you can try for vegetables or even, again, your whole wheat pita. Has any, I wonder if anyone's tried this. Um, a lot of times in the Mediterranean, if there's a spicy meal, this is why Greek yogurt is introduced. So it's sort of a cooling effect um, and it complements those spicy meals really well. Okay, next, not, not last but not least, next to last but least, um, I got to talk about herbs. Now I probably could spend an, a couple of hours, if not a day, <laughs> talking about all the different herbs of the Mediterranean and all the different spices as well. There's so many to list, right? I can't even possibly dive into all of them. So I'm just highlighting a few. Um, all of our herbs and spices, I mean, think about them from dill to cumin, to paprika, to sage, to coriander. Oh my gosh, to even just garlic, fennel, black pepper, right? There's so many to consider as part of the Mediterranean diet. And they have these compounds that are really special. And I think we often don't regard herbs and spices as being so cancer protective when they, they are. Um, and yes, they add flavor. Yes. They sit in our pantry, <laughs> but and maybe we're growing an herb garden, maybe, but we really want to think about how they add in such great flavor, a punch for, in terms of cancer protective nutrition. So ways to try herbs specifically, I think even if you make a vinaigrette, try a different herb inside of it. Just chop up. Maybe it's basil. Maybe you have mint. I don't know. Try whatever, you know, you desire. It's, it's your kitchen. Um, basil and mint added to sauteed summer squash is delicious. I think you, you can even use a combination of these herbs as well. Um, in the cooler months to use sprigs of rosemary or thyme, and that's a great way to flavor your stock or your stew or even your braises. So if you already have a recipe, think about adding that as well. Um, and I also love the idea of using, um, making your own homemade tea by steeping an herb inside it, and then you can strain it out. It's, it's delicious. And again, the sky's the limit. There's so many different ways you can even get, um, tea bags, right. That are unused and you can wrap some herbs inside and steep a tea bag that way. And I think it's sometimes a great way to use, maybe you bought herbs for a particular recipe and you don't know what to do with the rest of it. I think making a homemade tea and then even icing it this time of year is a great way to use up those remaining herbs. Now, dried herbs and spices, they or dried spices do have a, a lifespan, right? So I've read anywhere from a year to 18 months, um, but I think a good rule of thumb is to give it the sniff test. I think as soon as they start to lose their flavor, their flavor and smell, then you've lost some of the potency, right? So just like I explained with olive oil, how it has that kind of pungent, uh, bite in the back of your throat when you enjoy like high quality, fresh olive oil. Same thing goes for herbs and spices. Like once they lose that, they've lost some of those compounds. So we're not really reaping the benefits then of the cancer protection. I will say, however, that it's not harmful, right? It's not harmful to have maybe stale spices like I do, <laughs> um, but you just might not get the maximum type of protection that you're looking for. So just keep that in mind. So I wanted to share, and this recipe I have included for everyone, this is za'atar. Maybe you have heard of za'atar. It's Middle Eastern and think of it like salt. So they use it over in the Middle East, like we use salt. It goes on everything. And it's like, again, another flavor bomb. There's lots of different herbs and spices that are added to this. Really, it's just spices. So it's thyme, oregano, something called sumac, which is, has a citrusy flavor, really unique spice, uh, marjoram. Um, and then they toast some sesame seeds and they blend that all together. Um, some, not all zatars are the same. So they use different amounts and different quantities to make different flavors of zatar and uh, really special seasoning. They also sell za'atar. Um, if you look in the stores, you should be able to see it. If you don't see it in the grocery store, um, there's a lot of local spice shops that probably carry za'atar and you may enjoy it. Great way to like reduce the salt in our diet, right? But also reap the benefits 
of cancer protection at the same time. Okay, last, I think this is the last quiz question. Which fruit is considered to be the oldest cultivated fruit in the entire world? This is a tricky one as well. <laughs> Did anyone guess? I have some great guesses. So in terms of my homework, what I saw was that dates, dates are the oldest cultivated fruit in the world. So they have some fossils that were discovered that suggested that they were around 50 million years ago. <laughs> I mean, that's mind blowing, right? But if dates have stood the test of time, I believe they're good enough for us, right? So there are some cancer fighters in dates, but also all fruit has cancer fighters. Um, polyphenols sp specifically are anti-inflammatory. Lignans I spoke about earlier with our beans, right? And then fiber as well. So we know that this special ancient fruit is offering us lots of cancer protection. So lots of different ways to try dates. Um, I like to add it even to savory dishes. So if you add it um, like with something like a nut, like pistachios I have listed there to a grain or a green salad, it's going to add like that little bite of sweet once in a while. And it's really delicious. If you haven't had a date yet in your life, I invite you please to try one. <laughs> they are absolutely delicious. They're so satisfying, especially if you're someone who likes a little sweet, they will give you that satisfaction for sweet. There's no question. Um, I especially enjoy stuffed dates. So especially with something like almond butter or peanut butter, or even to chop up some nuts and stuff them inside dates. Um, it, it gives that again, that contrast and different texture that you, when you eat it, it, you sort of pause, you know, and you really savor it. And I think that's a nice way of eating and especially something sweet. It's a nice way to enjoy that. So I wanted to share some resources that I think are especially helpful if you're curious to learn more about the Mediterranean diet. So Old Ways is um, thanks to a think tank that includes the Harvard School of Public Health, um, as well as some other experts. And it's meant to be really good evidence-based information on their website, but also to lots of great resources. So if you want like a food list of what foods are on the Mediterranean, you know, you can download and print that out for yourself. Uh, there also are tons of recipes. So if you're looking to explore different ways of eating um, Mediterranean, this will be the best way to go. If you're curious, I spoke a lot about olive oil. So if you're curious to learn more, about olive oil, about its properties, about some of the myths and misconceptions about purchasing olive oil and storing it properly, cooking it. The North American Olive Oil Association has a great website for you as well. They also have a particular seal and they put their seal of approval on some of the olive oils that we can buy in the grocery store. I also think you might be interested in the Mediterranean Nutritionist. Uh, this is a dietitian that runs that website, as well as Fully Mediterranean, another dietitian. And um, because there's so much interest, I am happy to see that there are some real experts in the field that are offering us some great information. So in summary, I want to remind you that the Mediterranean diet is really not a diet, but it's a way of life. It is a version of a plant-based diet. Research does support that the foods consumed by those that live in the Mediterranean are cancer protective. And research also shows that those that live in the Mediterranean are less likely to be diagnosed with cancer. The Mediterranean lifestyle is more than just what they eat, right? So it includes activity as well as social interactions that are centered around food. And I think that's a very important concept. So a lot of the food and recipes in the Mediterranean, they're passed down from generation to generation, right? So they are sharing in the procurement and the preparation and the enjoyment of the food that they're making. And it's 
um, they take their time eating. Um, and I touched on a little bit on that earlier. They may not eat breakfast. It's usually something that's kind of light. Um, and they really take their time. They may spend hours at the dining table. And if you think about that in comparison to how most of us eat here, um, I think it's a very interesting observation. The Mediterranean diet can be deliciously simple way to promote the nutritious foods in your life. So with that said, that is all for my PowerPoint presentation. So I wanted to thank you again for attending. And I believe that